Let's try that again. So, as I mentioned uh, in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in my 11 o'clock class, this is my daughter Stephanie, and I joked that she was in stage five of the word no. So stage one is hearing the word no and not liking it very much. Stage two is learning how to say it back to us as her parents. Stage three she it was when she enjoyed to say the word no. She was in that stage for a long time. Stage four is like creative ways of saying the word no. So, you know, like, no, I want it now, or why. But she's in stage five, and stage five is when she goes, Mommy, can I have some ice cream? No. Okay. Daddy, can I have some ice cream? That's stage five. So, uh, so for any of you who are uh, planning on, on having little ones in the not too distant future, I'm, I'm keeping a log of the, uh, the, the word no. The, the thing is, though, she was supposed to stay a baby, and she didn't. She kept getting bigger. And uh, that's a problem. I haven't, I haven't figured that one out yet, so if anybody has some pointers, let me know. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, but yeah, uh, so but going into my, my background, so yeah, uh, I am the associate dean here at the college, so um, that means I'm in charge of sort of the administration of all the academic side of things. Um, I'm also uh, uh, sort of head up the college's advising efforts uh, and whatnot. So if you ever have any questions about course scheduling or uh, uh, anything like that, or your graduate, your your track towards graduation. You can either reach out to me or Justin Fleming, our, our College of Student Support Specialist, and either one of us can, can help you out with that. Um, <laughs> I did go to that school up north. I got my PhD at WVU uh, and then came here. I've been here ever since. This year will be my 10th year uh, here at Marshall. Um, I am a registered professional engineer in the state of West Virginia, uh, and I've been at Marshall since I finished my PhD at WVU, so I've been here for a while. Um, I am also a faculty in the Civil Engineering Department. Uh, my background is as a structural engineer, so uh, I primarily focus on things like bridge engineering uh, and steel design. A lot of the work that I've done um, and on the research side of things is sort of trying to characterize um, uh, short span bridges, particularly short span steel bridges. Mainly I'm trying to make them more efficient and more economical and make the design process a little easier. I do a, a lot of work uh, in a computer, but whenever I get a chance to go out into the field, I, I do a uh, I do, you know, snatch that opportunity whenever I can. Um, I also spent a fair amount of my uh, younger days uh, in the field as a surveyor. I used to, uh, to work for a firm back home uh, and spent a lot of time finding property corners uh, and whatnot throughout the southern end of the state. So I, I definitely know my way uh, around some surveying equipment. So I'm actually really excited to, uh, uh, to teach the class. It's been a while since I've taught a course that had a lab component to it, which is um, which is always uh, uh, pretty exciting. And we get to go outside, which is a lot of fun, too. So if, if you like to go outdoors, you're going to definitely get your opportunity uh, in here. Oh, my goodness. Like I said, I'm the associate dean. I've been getting, this has been my, my day, and it will probably be my week. Um, oh, I need to click the screen. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, the operation of the class because I want to make sure that everybody's clear on how the course is structured, how your grade's going to be computed, make sure that everybody understands the logistics of, of how things uh, operate. Um, so first off, um, the grade. So the grade in this course uh, is split up between a few components. So the attendance is 5%, um, and we'll get into the logistics of that here in a bit. Um, the primary bulk of the work in this class and the assignments come from the homework and from the lab exercises. And so the lab exercises will be a, a combination of uh, work involving CAD, AutoCAD, uh, and work in the field. Predominantly work in the field. Um, you might have seen students with these reflective vests out on like bus Kirk and Gulks and whatnot. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, but that's, that was this class, if you ever saw it, that was, that was this, so we're going to be doing that. Um, and so the lab exercises, the lab reports, the, the drawings and whatnot that you submit along with the homework comprises the bulk of the class. Um, we do have celebrations of learning. We don't have exams in college. We call them celebrations of learning. So we're going to be celebrating three times during lecture this semester. Um, that was a joke, not very funny. Um, two of them during the, um, uh, during the semester, and then one during the university uh, final exam week. Um, the textbook for the class is this one right here, uh, Surveying Fundamentals and Practice, 7th edition. 
Um, this was actually a change from a couple of years ago. There was a textbook by Wolf and Galani that we'd used for years, and we recently made that switch. And this is my first time teaching it in a long time. And when I uh, chatted with the previous instructor, I kind of get uh, why he made the change, because I think this is a pretty handy uh, reference. Um, let's talk about some of the technology tools, um, and, and I will level with you. So this course is operated uh, a little differently than uh, like you know, a standard course in the sense that we have actually two sections in the same room. So the way that this class works, there's a section 101 and a section 102. Everybody meets for the same lecture, but you have different lab sections. So the section 101 meets for the Wednesday lab, section 102 meets for the Thursday lab. So um, what that meant is that, uh, why that's relevant here, is that, um, so I use Blackboard pretty uh, regularly, pretty religiously uh, in my courses. So um, I use it for grade posting quite a bit. So at any random point in time, if you're interested in what your grade is, go to Blackboard, it's going to be current. I, I'm make sure that I'm really consistent with that. I, I mentioned that uh, in my last class, I said that when I was developing my teaching philosophy, I said what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect a list of all the stuff that professors used to do that annoyed me when I was in college. I said, I'm not going to do that. Okay. And so one of the things that used to annoy me is when I was, take t uh, when I was in a class, I didn't know what my grade was. I said, we're not going to have that. So you're going to know what your grade is by going to Blackboard. Uh, uh, pretty regularly. Now, I say that with at least a, a caveat here recently. So because there were two sections, there were two different course shells. So I actually just got those course shells merged this morning. Um, so not everything's fully up to date with like the grade columns and whatnot. So like I said, I'm going to keep everybody you know apprised on your progress and grades, but I guess just give me a few days to get everything built and whatnot. With my last class, I had everything sort of set up and ready to go. With this one, I didn't want to build two sections <laughs> and then... Um, uh, you know, at the same time, I wanted to wait till they were merged and then build them. Well, that happened today, so it's been a busy day. So I, I will get that done. Um, one thing that we uh, are going to do in this class is we're going to be submitting our homework assignments electronically. So um, what I would do is uh, a, a common means of doing that among uh, for students is to use an app like Cam Scanner. Uh, or Microsoft Lens and whatnot. You can download those. They're Apple and Android friendly uh, and they're free. Um, and I even recorded a little video a while back on how to actually use what Cam Scanner to, from written assignment to actually uploading it uh, to, to Blackboard. Um, I'll mention something right here. I have had questions from students who will say something along the lines of, um, uh, well, I have an app on my iPad that I can like do the homework on, and it'll just convert to a PDF. Can I upload that PDF as my homework? Sure. I, I don't have a problem with that. My main um, sort of uh, um, sticking point for when you submit your homework assignments, I just want them to be neat and legible. So as long as that's the case, um, I'm fine if you submit, you know, if you scan and submit, or if you have like an app that will automatically convert. Either one's fine. Just as long as it's a PDF and as long as it's legible, I'm not going to micromanage. Anyone, any method's totally fine uh, with me. All right, uh, technology tools. So um, I do have, I, I do tend to use Microsoft Teams uh, 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 somewhat regularly for what I would call periodic class communication. So a good example of when I use Teams is, let's say I have a homework assignment and there's a question about problem two. And, and one of you asks me that question, and I'm answering, and I go, wow, that's probably something everybody ought to hear. And so in order to get the word out pretty quickly, I'll put a post on Teams and say, hey, everybody, by the way, on problem two, you might want to watch out for this or make sure there's an error here. And so like, I want to make sure that if I'm you know, helping out a student, if there's something that everybody needs to hear, then everybody, you know, I'll distribute it via Teams. Um, I still need to get the Teams channels merged for the class. That hasn't happened yet. So I haven't messed with the team, uh, the Teams channel yet. One of the things that I um, I do like to do within Teams is I use the the OneNote uh, uh, class notebook within Teams. So whenever I do problems on the board, if you will, I don't actually do problems on the board. I do them within the OneNote, so that you know if you're doing your homework at you know nine o'clock at night, you can open that up and you can see literally everything I wrote on the whiteboard whenever you know you have time. So um, I haven't got again. I haven't got that set up yet because I haven't gotten the teams merged. Uh, but I will uh, uh, as soon as possible. Um, I do have some other software packages that you should work. Uh, you should be aware of. 
Um, make sure that you know you've got Chrome or Firefox installed, and that you've got Microsoft Office installed. One big one that I don't have here on the uh, on here is AutoCAD, but I got a slide uh, dedicated to that here in a bit. Um, but one other tool from a technology standpoint that uh, that I'm going to have you use is your cell phones or your smartphones. Everybody, if you've got your, uh, uh, your oh, you have your smartphones. Come on, come on. Break out your smartphone because I want everybody to scan this. Let me make it a little bigger. And let me see if that works. Should bring up a little Google form. I'll give it, uh, take your time. I'm, I'm not counting anybody late today, so don't worry about that. So if you've had me for class before, which I think a few of you have, this is how I take attendance. So what I'll do is, uh, at the very beginning of every lecture, I'll have an announcement slide that kind of has something like this going on. So it's to make sure that you're aware that, you know, hey, by the way, there's a homework assignment due Friday or whatever. Bless you. Um, just to make sure that you're aware when stuff is due. And, oh, by the way, there's an exam coming up in a couple weeks, just general announcements. But I'll also have a QR code on the slide. So when we walk into class and we get started, the, the QR code's available. But I'm usually hovering on the announcement slide for a couple minutes just going through things. So you've got more than enough time to, to scan it uh, uh, and get your uh, attendance log. So that's that's how I will uh, collect the attendance. Did anybody have a problem with that just now? Okay, good. All right. Okay. All right, so let's talk about um, the prerequisites for the class. So this course requires a prerequisite of AutoCAD or of CE 102 uh, and ENGR 111. Um, and so we are going to be using uh, AutoCAD and Excel. Everybody hold on. No MATLAB. Oh. Oh, just, just hold on. <laughs> oh, I should mess with this. Oh, no, we're going to be writing scripts. Everybody goes, oh, no, you got to kid me. No, we're not going to be using any MATLAB in here. Don't worry about that. Uh, what's that? I said, thank Christ. Oh, thank come on. Matt Dr. Rommel was my biggest off last semester. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All that programming will throw you for a loop, won't it? Multiple loops, hey. <laughs> See, that's, I, I, that's one of my dad jokes. The loop is. <laughs> you all, you're going to have to get ready for it because I've got dad jokes. I've got dad jokes. I'm going to have my card in. I've got plenty of them, don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, but I do want to mention a few skills that you are going to need to retain from these classes. So on the 111 side, on the computation side, obviously the Excel stuff is going to be pretty important. Um, mainly things like preparing charts, so like graphing things in Excel. Um, also things like goal seek. There are a couple computations which I'm not sure if you were shown in 111, so uh, as an example, the ability to convert degrees, minutes, seconds to decimal degrees and vice versa. You probably weren't shown how to do that in 111. And we'll show you how to do that in this course, but it does require at least some basic Excel familiarity. So, I mean, your engineer's Excel should be your best friend. Um, we are going to be doing um, uh, some CAD in here, some generating some drawings. So the idea is we'll go out, collect some data, draw it up, okay? So, um, uh, for example, we'll be drawing, uh, generating topos, we'll be ju uh, doing traverses uh, and things like that. And so being able to draw that up uh, is important. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the Casio FX-115. That's the calculator that you should have been using at ENGR 111. Um, being, like, having that calculator is, is actually pretty important in here because the ability to convert degrees, minutes, seconds to decimal degrees and back and forth, it is very handy on that calculator. Either that or the TI-36X, they're, they're both kind of the same. But having that calculator really is kind of important. So if you uh, don't, uh, you don't have it today, no big deal, but I would start bringing it to class. So, so that, uh, just wanted to mention that. Um, Okay, a couple other things. So uh, attendance. So again, you all saw how I do attendance. That's how I'm going to collect attendance every day. So I will just, I'll have an announcement slide and I'll put a little QR code there at the bottom of the screen. You all can scan that and bring that in. Um, let's talk about lectures. So I am recording this lecture right now. And what I'm recording is the audio and I am recording what's on the screen. That's another reason why I like to use the screen to actually do the problems like on the whiteboard. 
because I will take that lecture recording and I will post it to YouTube. I will have a YouTube playlist dedicated to the class. Uh, a few of you have had me for class before, and you know I've done that in statics and things like that. And I'm going to continue to do that here. Now, I'm not going to do that for the labs because I'm, for the most part we're going to be outside and, and just working on things. So I, won't, I won't do that for there, but I will do that for the lectures uh, and whatnot. So I wanted to mention that now. Um, what I'm doing is I'm recording the lectures, and then once they process, I will then upload them to YouTube. So, I mean, we have class, you know, from 1 p.m. to 1.50 p.m. Do not expect the recording to show up at 1.51 p.m. Like, it'll take me a while to, to do it. But I will try and get those uploaded in a pretty uh, expeditious fashion. And then on Blackboard, there is a link to that playlist. So if you go, you click, go to Blackboard, click that playlist, all the lecture recordings uh, will all be right there. Um, Let's talk about uh, homework in the class. Um, so uh, for those of you that have had me for class before, you probably have heard that I'm kind of notorious for my daily homework assignments where I'll have like a homework assigned Monday, do Wednesday, one Wednesday, do Friday, one Friday, do Monday. Um, I probably won't do that in here or at least to that um, uh, frequency because this course has a lecture and a lab. You know? So there's going to be like multiple assignments anyways, but what I will say is I'm usually not one to just assign some ridiculous volume of homework, especially when you have labs and other things to go on. I mean, I do assign homework, but I try and be pretty uh, reasonable about it. Um, so uh, it's typically due um, uh, at the beginning of lecture following when it's assigned, uh, but what I'll do on the assignment is make sure you know uh, when they're all due. And again, my, my main reason for being sort of, um, I don't want to say hesitant about it right now, but I'm going to do my best to try and avoid you having a bunch of stuff all due at the same time. Like, uh, like I don't want one day where you have a lecture and then a field lab and a CAD lab all due at the same time and then there's an exam. I'm trying to avoid stuff like that. I, I want to try and uh, uh, separate the work uh, as much as possible. I also have to be a little loose in a class like this because what if we have a differential leveling lab and it's a thunderstorm? You know, so I've got to I've got to be flexible with stuff like that. So that's why right now I don't have like a, a super hard and fast homework schedule like I do in some of my other courses because there's a little bit of flexibility with with things like that. Um, and again, I'm not going to get uh, um, I'm not going to get um, a super uh, 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 I'm not going to go on and on about the format. But again, as long as the um, my main sticking points. Or that it's neat and legible. I mean, I, you do need to follow this stuff too, but but I found that um, if you're if you're using relatively neat handwriting and using a straight edge when appropriate, you're not going to have uh, you're not going to have an issue. Um, and again, uh, what I will do for homework, oh, I'll mention something about the late homework. So I will accept late homework uh, with a, a 20 a 20 percent penalty, but I'll only accept it between when it's due, and when I post the solution. Because after I post the solution, it's like you have the answer, you know. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was, um, that was um, no. And, and all the solutions and whatnot will be posted uh, on Blackboard. Okay. We do have three celebrations of learning. Uh, and what, I, what I'll say that about this, we have three lecture exams. We actually do have two lab exams, but I'll talk about that here in a little bit. The lab exams aren't really like, tests the way you would think about them. They're just sort of they're just sort of more like unguided labs. Like and, and we'll we'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, but we have three lecture based exams. Two of them will be during the semester and the third one will be during the university uh, final exam slot. Um, as I mentioned, you know I try I developed a list of stuff that professors used to, to do that annoyed me and I said I'm not going to do it. And one of the things that used to annoy me when I was a student is a professor would give me an exam that takes six hours to do and say, here's 50 minutes. I, that really bugged me. I didn't like doing that because it stopped becoming an examination of my abilities as an engineer. And instead, it was just how fast can I write numbers and hit buttons on a calculator. It's like, that's not testing my abilities as an engineer. Um, so what I do is I use what, what I call a rule of three. So let's say you have an exam that's designed to be an hour long. I will design that exam, and then I will take it. Okay. And so if you're supposed to be able to do the exam in 60 minutes, I need to be able to do it in 20. That's my rule of three. So I actually time myself doing the exam. And if it takes longer than that, I will pare it down. And I will say, something's not right. I need to take this and trim this material down uh, and do that. So 
Um, exams in here will probably be formatted a little differently than maybe you've had for me like in statics and whatnot because in statics sometimes the problems can be long, like long problems. That doesn't really happen as much here depending upon the problem. Like our first exam might have a bunch more problems but the problems themselves are just small. They're just small problems. So. But again, that's my, my guiding principle is that you know if it's a 60 minute exam for you, it's a 20 minute exam for me. And, so, and for the most part, that seems to have worked pretty well. Okay, let's talk about the labs. So we have two uh, laboratory sections in this class. So again, you're both meeting for the same lecture. So lecture on Monday, lecture on Wednesday, no lecture on Friday, okay? So two hours of lecture, one hour of lab, or one credit hour of lab. The labs will meet for three hours on Wednesday and three hours on Thursday. I'll go ahead and tell you, not every lab, and most labs won't take the full three hours. Um, some of that is dependent upon your speed and, and how you work in a group, right? So, um, for example, maybe our, so I can tell you our, like, for example, our second lab, the horizontal distance measurement lab, will not take three hours. It, it probably will take two. Um, but then we might have a lab exam that just might take a little longer. So uh, it just depends on your speed and how you work in the group. But I, I would say, in my experience, very rarely is it the full three hours. Um, what we're going to do for labs is we're always going to start labs. We're not going to be in here for lab. We're going to meet in 2241. 2241 is on the second floor. So here's the lobby. It's just sort of like right in this corner over here. So on the other side of the building, in this back corner right here is 2241. We're going to start lab there every day. Okay. For the labs that we do that are outside, okay, so there is a, uh, an equipment storage locker that's room uh, 1202. So 1202 is on the first floor. It's on the, it's like along this hallway on the other side of the atrium, probably passed it a dozen times, you know, dozens of times and didn't recognize it. But it just says storage over there. But if you open that, that's where all the survey equipment is, all the levels and total stations and things like that. We're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, that's where we're going to store our equipment. So, for example, if we have a field lab, what that means is we'll start out in 2241. I'll say a few words about what exactly we're going to do. Then you'll collect your equipment and go do it. Um, one thing I'll mention, so in terms of attire, so we're going to talk about dress codes here in a bit. So everybody uh, is going to need to wear uh, no open-toed shoes, so make sure you're wearing closed-toed shoes for lab. Um, I would say weather appropriate clothing, so no like huge winter coats and things like that. You know, on a day like today, it's pretty warm. Um, if you feel like you need to wear sunscreen, it might not be a bad idea. We might be outside for, you know, one and a half hours, two hours, something like that. Um, one thing that everybody is going to wear is one of these, so these reflective vests with the awesome Marshall University Civil Engineering logo on the back. One thing I'll say about these, at the end of the semester, you get to keep these. These are yours. So what we're going to do at the beginning, of, and, and I think like we found students really like these because you know, if they go and get a job and are working on a construction site, they get to you know bring the swag with them and whatnot. Um, I mean, these are cool to have. I, I didn't get this when I was an undergrad. I wish I, I had this. Um, so uh, one thing about this, so we're going to give you these uh, at the end of the semester. They're yours to keep, but throughout the semester, we're going to keep them here. Okay, so. So, like for example, if, if we so if you look at the back, you're actually going to be able to you know mark your initials. So this will be like your uh, um, uh, vest and whatnot. So like for lab, you know you'll be able to like let's say it's Wednesday, you're going out the field. We'll store it in the locker. You'll bring it, wear it, and bring it back in the locker. We're going to keep the vests here um, throughout the semester. And the main reason for that is there's like 36 people here. We really want you to wear your vest. It's a safety thing as you're um, performing the surveys. And there's that one person that forgets it at home. So we're going to keep them here for the semester. But afterwards, they're yours. So that cool? All right. Now, um, a, a couple things about the uh, uh, lab. So most of the labs are going to be performed in groups of three. And when I said lab exam, so I, I sort of want to explain what a, a, a lab exam kind of uh, is like in this class. So. Um, we have two lab exams, but basically what they are are just sort of repeats of the exercises that you've already done. And so the first, I'll give you the first example. So the first uh, lab exam we have is what's going to be called a differential level. Okay, and a differential level is one of the first 
main types of land surveys that we're going to teach you how to do. And a differential level is basically intended to determine the elevation of a given point. Uh, and so basically what you do is you start with a point of known elevation, and the idea is to determine the, a point of unknown elevation. Okay, And you perform a differential level. Like you start at this point, work your way to the unknown point, and then work your way back, and then perform the error corrections. So before you do that lab exam, we have two differential levels that you're going to perform that are guided. So really the difference between a, um, a lab exam and just a lab exercise is that the first two are guided and then the, set, the, the exam is just sort of like on your own. But you'll have already done the exercise a couple times, so it'll be uh, pretty familiar. It's, uh, I, I don't want you to think it's like this under the gun, super high pressure uh, environment. I mean, you know, you got to do it right, but that's the case with all the labs uh, and whatnot. Um, don't, I would say don't bring anything that's like a hyper value. I mean, like you have your phone in your pocket and whatnot, but, uh, but you know, I mean, don't bring something that's like super nice if it's a little rainy. Um, I say the schedule may vary depending upon the weather. If it's like thunderstorms, we're not going outside, okay? But if it's just like overcast, we'll probably go. Okay, so because um, I want to make sure that you're on schedule to, to um, uh, meet the requirements of the course. And so uh, I have a tentative schedule, which I'm going to pull up here in a little bit. Um, uh, again, it might vary a little bit. That's why we call it tentative. Like, uh, I think at this point, it would probably be a good idea to bring up the syllabus. By the way, the syllabus is up uh, uh, uploaded on Blackboard now, so everybody can access this. There's nothing here that you can't access today. Um, so let's see, so section 101, you're in the Wednesday lab, section 102, you're in the Thursday lab. Again, we're meeting in here for lecture. Lab is in 2241, that's where we start. And again, we'll either be doing CAD or, um, uh, we'll either be doing CAD or out in the field. Um, my off, ooh, goodness, that, that scroll went quick. Uh, my office hours, I have scheduled uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 11. I say 9 to 10.50 because I have class at 11, so if you show up like Right at 10.50, there's a chance I might be heading to structures, so just keep that in mind. And on Thursday from 10 to 12, but I am kind of the associate dean, so I'm kind of around a lot. So if you need me more often than not, you could probably get a hold of me. Um, let's see. What else is, I think, worth mentioning? Oh, I'll tell you something I think is worth mentioning. Um, the policy on generative AI. Have you already had classes that have talked about this yet? Oh, okay. Um, so I'm, I have a feeling that I'm probably not the only person who's going to bring this up, but this university, as well as pretty much every other university across the country, are starting to have some very detailed discussions about ChatGPT, about what ChatGPT can do. Um, my policy, so what Marshall's done is they've developed sort of a series of standard templates that professors could use and then sort of let the professors just sort of decide how they want to do that. And they go from open use to restricted use to somewhere in between. For me, um, based on the nature of this course, you could use it or not. I don't think it would really matter. I don't think it's going to help. Um, and, uh, but like, you know, as long as you're following the student code and citing what you do, I don't really have a problem with it, but I don't think it's going to help. And to give you an example, uh, where I think there are some pitfalls with ChatGPT. I went to ChatGPT and I asked it, what is the standard deviation of a set of numbers? And I gave it like six numbers. It was like four, four, six, eight, eight, nine, something like that. I just picked some numbers. I said, what's the standard deviation? And it gave me an answer, and it was wrong. Because <laughs> um, you could just plug that into a Casio and ask it what the standard deviation is, and it did not give me the right answer. So it was rounding a lot of things and whatnot, and it wasn't accurate. Um, so. That being said, I think it's probably more of a concern among liberal arts, among writing courses and things like that. So all I would say is that for anybody in, in a course like that, just make sure you're following student code of conduct. You know, just you know, make sure you're following your course syllabi and whatnot. That's all I would say. Um, let me get to the um, the course schedule. So this is the schedule for the semester. Um, so this is organized a little differently than some of my other courses because we have labs and whatnot. So what I have here is the, the, the date of the lectures. And so these are the lectures. These are the lecture to uh, topics. 
and then these are the labs. So like week one, these are the what we're talking about uh, today and, uh, and Wednesday, and then this is what our lab's going to be. So the way this class is kind of built is we have lecture Monday, we have lecture Wednesday, and then we have lab afterwards. So the idea is that the labs will follow what we've discussed in lecture. So like, we're not going to have a differential leveling lab until we have discussed measuring vertical distances, because that's kind of what differential leveling is. Um, so there's, there's two different ways of doing uh, 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 differential levels, and so this lab will follow off of the first one. So the idea is you'll we'll teach something in class, and then we'll go up and practice it, okay? Um, one thing that probably won't move around are the lecture exams. So we are going to have our first exam on Wednesday, September 20th, our second exam on Monday, October 23rd, okay? Now, um, a couple things. Uh, I have a makeup day on Wednesday, October 11th, and the main reason for that is because if there's any one topic in here that's maybe a little tricky, it is the adjustment of a traverse. Traverse computations are just, they're just kind of long, and so um, we've got a couple of different lectures on horizontal control surveys, but we might have a day where we come in and just go through that math again. Um, but uh, We'll see where we're at in the class. If it's going smoothly, maybe we won't need to have lecture that day. Um, but my exams will probably not move. I also have an exam review day uh, built before each lecture. This, this Monday is a little different because I'm going to be out of town, so I'm going to pre-record this lecture and post it to the YouTube channel. Uh, but then we'll have our exam on that Wednesday. Here are the dates of our two lab exams. And again, there are two real big topics that we learn in this class from a survey perspective. Differential leveling and traversing. Those are the two big uh, uh, exercises that we do. We then take these um, these skills and then do topo surveys and horizontal curves uh, and things like that. But those are the two big skills. Uh, that we learn. All right, uh, any questions? Okay, all right. Um, all right, before I get into this, any um, questions about how the class is operated, anything like that? All right, I'm gonna that's all. I'll wear it with you out in the field, but like I'm, I'm in here. I'm not wearing it, so. Okay. All right. So um, one of the things that I, and I told this to my course uh, here about an hour ago, um, whenever I teach a class, I always like to make sure that I explain on day one why you're in the class, whether it's scholarships, whether it's loans, whether it's your parents, whether you're paying out of pocket, somebody put cash money on the table for you to be in this room, right? And so if you're going to be in here, I want you to understand why you're in here. And I could give you a very cheap answer and say, because you have to, have to graduate. Yeah, well, okay, but why? You know, that's, that's, that's skirting the issue, okay? And so I want you to understand why you're in this class. Now, it is true you are civil engineers, this is required for the major, but why? Um, as I said, I'm going to mix up the terms geomatics and surveying, okay? So let's talk about the two. Let's talk about uh, uh, surveying. What is surveying? Um, surveying, you know, it, it, it can have a pretty long-winded definition as with any of these uh, things, but uh, in short, surveying is the art of measuring distances and angles. That's basically it in a nutshell, particularly uh, 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 distances and angles on the land. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, 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 water survey, hydrographic surveys and things, things like that. But for the most part, we're talking about measuring the land. Um, why? What are we trying to do? Well, um, for one, we're trying to determine, so if we start talking about the narrow focus of surveying, we're trying to determine the position of points on the Earth's surface. Um, so trying to determine the location of existing points on the Earth's surface. But then the other thing we might be trying to do is lay out positions or desired positions of new points uh, on the Earth's surface. So a couple examples of that might be um, uh, boundary surveys or property surveys. Has anybody here ever known somebody who needed a survey of their property? Maybe their parents, maybe... Okay, so what that typically involves is setting the property corners, right? Locating the property corners. So if you own a, let's say you own a house here in the Huntington area, that lot is probably a rectangular tract of land. And so if you want to get a, a boundary survey done of your property, 
um, you need to locate existing corners and you may need to set new ones. There are reasons for doing that. Um, one of them might be if you are buying the property or purchasing the property, sometimes uh, 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 dependent upon the situation, uh, you might need that for your loan purposes. Sometimes you need to set the property corners or locate those for putting up a fence. You know, you don't want that fence to encroach upon the other person's property. I did a lot of surveys in my day where we were setting corners and locating the line for what we like to joke uh, as grudge fences when two neighbors didn't like one another and somebody wanted to put a fence up. I, I did that a lot. <laughs> Got some very interesting stories on that road, but we'll save those stories for another day. Um, some some arguments among neighbors that went down for the record books. I'll just leave it at that. Um, now, why, uh, now, that's on the boundary side, but let's talk about the construction side. So, for example, um, what we might be interested in laying, in terms of laying out new points, we might be wanting to lay out the position of a new road uh, or a new bridge or a new construction project. Um, what what does surveying do for us as engineers? It is the link between design and construction, right? So I'm a bridge engineer. I design a bridge. I give that design to a, a, a state DOT. They let the project out. Project gets bid out, gets won. First thing that happens more often than not is a land surveyor is going to go out and mark out the, the, um, the initial construction of the project. It will probably uh, involve uh, surveyors throughout the project to ensure that everything's being built according to the specifications, that elevations are, are correct, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, again, very critical skill, and, and again, it serves as the link between design and construction. So, who interacts with surveying data? Engineers, construction companies, you, know, you name it. Okay. Um, now, the name of this course is Introduction to Geomatics. Surveying and geomatics are, to be frank, they're kind of the same thing. The, um, maybe uh, if you get a job in a surveying department, you can impress your, your colleagues and your parents a little more say, I work for the geomatics department. You know, it sounds fancier. But the, the main reason for the, um, the, the introduction of the term is because we're starting to get better at how we um, uh, 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 perform our, our measurements of the Earth's surface. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we were using tapes and chains to, to measure the Earth, and now we're using, you know, electronic equipment and GPS and so on and so forth. It wasn't that long ago that we were drawing plaques and maps by hand, and now we're using uh, computer software to do that. So, geomatics is sort of a um, uh, it is sort of a um, uh, uh, a means of the industry recognizing that we're getting a lot better at this than we used to be. Um, so a little bit about um, land surveying, I mean, I, I want to make sure this is clear. This concept and this um, idea of measuring the earth is certainly not a new one. I mean, there, um, there are records of the Egyptians using uh, land measurement techniques as early as 1400 BC. I'm curious, why do you think that they were interested in that? Why was that important? Well, I, let, me, let me take a step back. So. Um, there, there, um, you know, there are uh, uh, records and, uh, and whatnot of property being measured. Let's say along the Nile, and the Nile floods recedes. Now you got to remark the the, the the property lines. But why would you be interested in that? Why why is that important? Measuring property. Why is that important? You got what's up? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Well, for one, you'd want to know where your property line is as opposed to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Why would the government be interested in knowing your property lines? Taxation. There you go, money. You get taxed on a per, per area basis, so you can't forget that, right? So, yeah, I mean, you pay property taxes, like, you know, even today, I mean, you pay property taxes uh, depending upon the acreage of the, the property that you own. There are, you know, you take that, you start uh, advancing it uh, in, in the future, and you start looking in the 18th and 19th centuries, and you started finding um, more refinements in the science uh, from Europe, from England and France, because they wanted to understand the boundaries of the properties that they owned. I mean, 
Uh, and then you start getting into other motivations like understanding land measurements for war, uh, national defense, uh, and things like that. Uh, but I would say that the science of surveying in, from the 1400 BC time period to now really saw its, its chief technological uptick in the past like 50 years. Okay, Because with the intervention of total stations and GPS uh, and Google Maps and all that stuff, that, that stuff, that, that level of technology has really only been very recently. And since then, the, um, the ideas and the, the concepts behind land surveying have substantially changed. I'm talking historically uh, and whatnot. Um, I do want to introduce today two terms for you. Uh, so the difference between geodetic uh, surveying and plane surveying. And so um, geodetic surveying is much more of a large scale concept. So we're talking about drawing maps for like counties and states and, and things like that, incredibly large areas. And so basically what geodetic uh, surveying is trying to do is account for the curvature of the earth uh, during your survey. And so if you were trying to draw a map of the United States, uh, for example, you would need to understand that curvature correction um, in order to get an accurate map for, say, I don't know, the state of West Virginia, right? The state of West Virginia is really big. Um, and so that's geodetic surveying. Plane surveying, however, assumes the earth is flat. And for the, the scale of projects that most civil engineers are, are, are working on, for the most part, that's fine. So to give you some numbers on that, so if you have a line along the earth that's about 12 miles long, if you look at the difference between assuming that it's plain versus accounting, uh, account, uh, uh, accounting for the ellipsoidal arc and whatnot, you're only talking about lengths, lengths that differ by about a quarter of an inch. So if we're t uh, talking about uh, land surveys for most you know, boundary properties or construction projects for like a new Walmart or something like that, you don't really need to account for that because it's really not going to, um, uh, 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 it's not going to amount to much difference from a mathematical perspective uh, at the end of the day. So I just want to make sure that, so for the most part in here, what we're going to be doing is plane surveying because again, for the scale of what we're talking about, uh, it really won't amount to, to much of a difference. Now, that science, that idea of plane surveying, that is going to be used to perform different types of jobs that, that surveyors would do. And as I mentioned, one of them uh, is a boundary survey. And so this, you know, asking how many of you have had that done. This is where you're trying to define the property corners and the, the state of a, a tract of land. Um, and one thing I didn't mention um, uh, earlier, but I kind of want to mention now, um, it is said that um, surveying is as much of an art than it is science. And, and I hold that to be true. Um, and some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, how, where are you come up with that? Well, let me give you an example using a, a boundary uh, uh, survey. So, um, again, how many was it that have had either parents or that had a boundary survey for? Let me ask you a question. Was it, are you talking about your parents? Yeah. Yeah. So, do they have... So do they own land? Like, is it in the city or is it in like a rural area? Yeah, it's in like a, like a, it's about an acre land. In, the, in a rural area? Yeah. Oh, that's a perfect example. That's a perfect example. So, uh, when when was uh, just? It was around. like it was like when I was younger, about like fifteen. Okay. We had to get. We had like a. They were trying to put up a like a shed at the back edge of our property. And then what? A crouch. Yeah. That's okay. This is a great crouch, example. Yeah. This is a great example. Okay. So whenever you do a survey like that. One of the first things that the surveyor has to do is they have to go to the courthouse. And what they do is they start looking up uh, deeds for your surrounding properties. Because let's say, let's just say, okay, let's look at this tract of land here on the screen. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, maybe ten property corners, something like that. That's Of those ten property corners, maybe three of them exist. And maybe the rest you have to actually locate and set, okay? But here's where things get a little tough, okay? So that survey, let's say that survey is being done in what, 2016, 2017, something like that? Okay, so this survey is done in 2016, 2017. This survey here, that was done in 2004. This one was done in 1963. 
This one was done in the 80s. This one was done in the 70s, right? All with different degrees of accuracy, right? That survey that was done in 63, it points to a rock up the hill as the corner. Rock isn't there anymore. This one points to a tree up the hill. You walk here, it's literally a forest. Which tree? <laughs> you think I'm joking, I'm not, you know? You also have to recognize that some of those lines were shot with laser measurement devices. Some of them were by pulling a chain up a hill, okay? So being able to, so, so in that, in that example, what's truth? You see what I mean? That's kind of tough, you know, and it requires judgment. I mean, there are rules to follow and so on and so forth, but every job's different. That's a, that's a difficult challenge. Um, I have been, I kid you not, I have been on a site, this was a, a, a job I did, I want to say it was near Spanishburg, uh, I can't remember, um, but uh, I, we were trying to locate a property corner, and <laughs> I, I'm going up the hill, like it was so wooded, like we had an ATV, and so I'm taking the ATV up the hill, right, and I get up top of the hill, and I'm trying, I've got my metal detector with me, and I'm like trying to pace out the distances, which is something we're going to be doing a little later in here, but I go to where the, um, the corner is supposed to be, and I see a problem. And I radio my boss and I say, there's a problem. He says, what? There were four property corners already set. There were four different surveyors that had come in from you know, surveying this track and this track, and this was this one corner, and they set four different corners, so which one's the right one? Yeah, that, that, that gets kind of tough. And unfortunately, we live in a fairly litigious society, which means these uh, uh, actions that we're talking about can get litigated uh, upon. Um, all right, let me, real, I know we're getting short on time, so let me real briefly talk about some of the other types of surveys that we're going to do. Uh, we're actually going to do a topo survey in here. We do the survey on this uh, hill between like Bus Kirk and the upper uh, 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 tract of land over here because there's literally no other hill on campus. This campus is very flat. Uh, so we're going to do a topo there, but obviously we need to know topos for earthwork and things like that. Um, one of the things about construction surveys is that some construction surveys are focused on an area, whereas some are focused on a route, on a linear type of survey. So linear surveys would, or route surveys would be more uh, uh, geared towards like road projects or rail projects or pipeline projects and so we'll talk about the terminology and and how those are addressed a, a little later um, i've actually had some some uh, professional experience doing hydrographic surveys i worked for a company that did gps positioning in the gulf of mexico um, that did uh, they were trying to map out where oil pipelines were and so we were laying like 100 miles of pipe along the gulf of mexico and having to locate that with an underwater robot and things like that so those are I mean, the, the math behind that got very interesting because not only are, are we having to account for curvature and things like that, but we had to account for signal refraction, like that, that Snell's law between you know, a signal going across different levels of salinity uh, in, in seawater. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention mine surveys. We're not going to do any of this in here, but um, obviously that's a, a readily important skill uh, here in the state of West Virginia. Um, being able to map underground uh, locations. Um, one thing we're not going to talk about are solar surveys in here, but those those can be uh, important for things like easements uh, and things like that. Um, and then probably what's more um, important today, or starting to become more important, are surveys using like uh, aerial photographs and drones. Think like Google Earth uh, and 3D buildings and things like that. Um, last thing I'll mention, because I know we're running short on time, is trying to achieve your surveying license in the state of West Virginia. I'm a licensed engineer, I'm not a licensed surveyor, um, but I know that, that we have had students at, uh, at Marshall that have pursued that track and gone and taken their FS exam. Um, the process by which you get your uh, surveyor's license is very similar to uh, uh, your engineer's license. Um, and uh, I've got some you know, data here on that. This, these slides, by the way, are already uploaded on Blackboard. So if you're interested, I uh, would check it out. Um, and but maybe I'll round this out again as the semester closes. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. I'm going to pull up the code one more time in case anybody didn't get it. But again, these notes and everything's on Blackboard. I'll pull up the code in case you didn't get attendance. But I will see you all on Wednesday.